companies operating in today's global economy really need to get an understanding of the international geopolitical risk landscape. At Infortel Worldwide, we work with our clients on solving risk before it starts. Welcome to the Riskology Podcast, where we're looking at managing business risk globally and really understanding the geopolitical risk landscape. So welcome back, everyone, to the latest episode of Riskology by Infertal. And of course, we're hitting another milestone episode here, episode 30. And it wouldn't be a milestone without having our featured guest, Tom Fox, join us. Tom, great to have you back. Chris, great to be back. So really happy to be part of the Compliance Podcast Network and make it to 30. I had no doubt you'd hit 30. So for today, you know, we thought we would hit on a subject that, you know, it's been hit pretty hard in the headlines even on the Compliance Podcast Network, there's a few episodes that hit on the Boeing situation. You recently published an article with Corporate Compliance Insights that I think really does a nice job of encapsulating a lot of the big picture issues that we're really looking at from a corporate compliance standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint, national security, international affairs, you name it, this Boeing situation really hits all of those areas. So I thought we could unpack that from the perspective of looking at the big picture and then the impact to international relations. And to do that, you know, maybe we can start by sort of breaking down the idea of the omnibus monitorship that might be necessary to write the ship for Boeing. Sure. So my proposal was that there be sort of a monitor of monitors at the top, but then there would be a variety of specific subject matter monitors. Though those subjects would include culture, ethics, compliance, HSE, safety, QAQC, manufacturing, whistleblowing and speaking up, internal controls, fraud, export controls, and sanctions. And the reason I wanted to take this approach, or I did take this approach, Chris, is I view this as the most important monitorship the DOJ has ever engaged in. Obviously, there have been huge cases before, from Siemens to Volkswagen to Goldman Sachs, in the FCPA world, finds a billions of dollars. But I think this company touches more of the American economy and indeed more individual Americans than certainly any product manufacturer. They're not going to touch as many as Walmart, but we have a company that has a $77 billion annual revenue. So obviously a hugely important part of the U.S. economy. But there are only major commercial airline manufacturer, Chris, and they're one of two in the world. So literally on a worldwide basis, we need a vibrant, compliant, and ethically correct culture at Boeing. I think 80% of all U.S. domestic airplanes are Boeing-built planes. So Boeing's customers, the airlines, are investing heavily in their products. But now we get to Tom and Chris because we both travel for our jobs. That's right. And, you know, if 80% of the planes are Boeing, I mean, I don't want to fly an Embraer. You know, I want to be on a Boeing. And it's, I think, 60% of Americans. So that's six times three, you know, 180 million, 200 million people are flying annually. And if 80% at that, that's 160 million Americans. So we, and I mean, you and I on this podcast, we are Boeing customers because we're consumers of their product. And that's just on the commercial side. I haven't gotten to the national security issues or space. So they are a major national security contractor in the aerospace industry. They are a major player and partner of NASA and the U.S. space effort going forward. They're a huge manufacturing concern in the United States. And my English wife says, please don't think of this as American. This is a worldwide issue. And so internationally, and you just touched on that and made me realize everything I'm about to say applies internationally as well. Mm -hmm. So we, and I mean, starting with Tom and Chris, everybody listening to this podcast, and over half of all Americans have a vested interest in getting Boeing right. And all of that led me to say, take this monitorship to an entirely new level. This is not too big to fail. This is the American people, the American government, the American commercial industry cannot allow Boeing to fail. And we have to get it right. And we have to get their culture right. So that's really was the genesis of my omnibus monitor approach that asked the DOJ to think big. 
do not have a one firm monitor come in and say, well, you know, we're going to fix your compliance program. We're going to get your policies and procedures correct. No, 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 no. This is about culture. And this is to the very roots. I mean, down to the shop floor at Boeing. They've got to get this right. And they can't hide and it can't be opaque. It's got to be transparent. Is it going to cost a lot of money? You bet. But at the end of the day, if we can get Boeing right, we'll have the vibrant Boeing that we had in the 90s. Yeah, I think you nailed it. And you really hit it home with bringing up the too big to fail moniker, because I hear that in a lot of conversations with colleagues. You'll see it splattered around the press. Here we go. Here's another situation where we've got a company too big to fail and the government needs to jump in and bail them out. That's not what we're talking about here. I mean, some of those statistics you cited, including us on this podcast episode, we're all indirect customers of this company. There's only two firms worldwide that are really at a scale able to operate in this space. So this is different than too big to fail. This isn't market impact. This isn't, you know, ripples that will be felt across the economy. This is really the only American manufacturer and one out of two across the world. I did today want to jump into more of the sort of international dynamics that are at play here. And I was looking before at the breakdown of the revenue reporting that Boeing has done so far this year. And it looks like roughly, I would say 37% of Boeing's revenue is through government contracts. And that's here in the US. But a lot of that is indirect contracts with other companies and other countries located abroad. And so a lot of these planes and systems and national defense security things that are developed are sold overseas, either indirectly through our government wings or directly to foreign companies. And so that has a major impact on security worldwide. And really, we haven't seen the reaction yet from too many of the European partners. They're kind of quiet at the moment. And Airbus is particularly quiet at the moment. But I wanted to see sort of what your take might be in in terms of, you know, starting with the European outlook, but then allies all across the world. So let's go back to the first Lion Air crash. What was Boeing's response? Pilot error. User error. And why was that? It's because they had set up a purchase package so that you could get regular training, enhanced training, and the full training. But you had to pay for more. Now, let me get this straight. You're going to put a plane in the air and we're not going to give you the full training unless you pay for the full package? No, no, no. If you've got a plane with a new system, which they had on the 737 MAX, you have to train the pilots on that. And that's what directly led to the failure and the crash and then the second crash. So that's obviously, to me, a culture problem because you don't put safety in the point where you have to pay more to get full training. And then if you start blaming other countries' pilots for that, well, then you're essentially blaming the customer. And all of those were wrong. So from a customer relations standpoint, on the civilian side, we haven't even got to the national security or military applications. But on the commercial side, it was just a disaster. And if I were Airbus, I'd be sitting there just smiling because they are the 100% beneficiary of this. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to say anything. They just say nothing. Boeing is over here and still in a cultural miasma. You know, we've all heard the whistleblower stories. They're still coming forward. And I think the world's other airline manufacturer doesn't have to do a whole lot. And what's Boeing going to do if Airbus locks up five years of sales, which becomes 10 years of sales? How long is Boeing then the number two? And what does that mean for all of the stakeholders, including the shareholders, of Boeing. So internationally, I think it's as big a disaster is as it is domestically, you know, literally starting with the first 737 MAX crash, the reasons for the crash, Boeing's attitude that it was pilot error because the airlines, the Ethiopian airline didn't pay for the top training package. That's just a cultural deficit that Boeing was obviously blind to. And that's one of the things that they have to fix. I mean, if I'm Ethiopian National Airlines, I'm just picking up the phone and calling Airbus. And that's it. So I think you're absolutely spot on for the international commercial market. Boeing has a huge hole to climb out of. The Boeing CEO is going to make a tour of 
U.S. Airlines to Southwest, United, Delta. Well, I hope he's doing that internationally as well because they're buying a large number of Boeing aircrafts and Boeing has to fix that customer relationship as well. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Good to point out that in how Boeing has responded to a lot of these situations, it's clear almost immediately that there's a cultural problem and a cultural failure that's inherent in all levels of the organization. And that's really at the core of the problem here. As we look at moving forward and, and implementing, let's say they do go for the omnibus monitorship program, along with a lot of the other regulatory headaches that they're ultimately going to have to deal with in the next few years, that's not going to increase efficiency. That is not going to increase productivity. So I think that even puts more pressure on the firm in terms of meeting the orders that they currently have, not to mention gaining new orders once people start looking at their productivity rate. So when you think of it in that context, I can absolutely see why Airbus is sort of sitting quietly at the moment, probably feeling a lot better about things than they were two to three years ago or not long after that FCPA violation scenario that they were in. So I think they're quietly sitting on the sidelines, seeing where this ends up. I mentioned just before that 30% of their revenue stream is from these government contracts. And that's extremely important in the context of international affairs, because a lot of the negotiations from a security standpoint with our allies, a lot of times involve bringing private sector partners to the table, because our allies around the world are looking to constantly improve their military, constantly improve their readiness, as particularly now as we've got hot wars around the world. And so now one of the big players in that world, Boeing, is really at a disadvantage. And so I think that really makes it important that the U.S. government, the private sector players involved here get it right. If you were to take it a step further and really look at how a, an omnibus monitorship could be organized and set up, where do you think it should naturally sit in terms of who should control it? How should the reporting look? Because I think that can have a significant impact at those international negotiations as people are looking at the viability of partnering with the U.S. and Boeing. So we've got a couple of different things going on here, Chris. We have a criminal plea, but we also have a victim's rights law. So we have a court overseeing the criminal plea as well as the victim's rights in this. I think that alone requires some type of court oversight. Whether how that would work out for the monitor, it might mean that the monitor, the omnibus monitor, would either report to or be in consultation with a court special master, for instance. But the monitor, the omnibus monitor, has to have the authority to literally start with the board of directors. The board can't be insulated. It's all going to start with the board, and I'm sure the board's going to say the right things. But as we all know, it's not the talk, it's the walk. Yeah. And will the board follow through with their commitments and then senior management? And will they set the values of the company and all of those things? So whatever reporting Boeing did under its prior DPA, obviously it was insufficient. They were reporting to the Department of Justice. So we've got, you know, this anomaly that Boeing failed as the DOJ has called out and said they failed, which has led to this plea agreement. So I think we need more oversight and a different form of oversight than our typical compliance monitor that we've seen in the past. And we've got to bring as many resources to bear as we can, Chris. America has to get this right. And what you've driven home is, Tom, it's not just America. You know, it's the rest of the world, too. Because the world cannot have one airplane manufacturer. We've got to have multiple sources, whether you call it competition, whether you call it resource constraint, whatever it may be, we need Boeing on an international basis, not simply for trade, but delivering that product to literally the world's airline companies. Yeah. And at the end of the day, look... An American company should be leading the way, both in innovation, getting it right, and really building the future. You know, I keep focusing on the security side of things, but even from a commercial standpoint, there's no reason an American company can't lead the way here. And I totally agree with you. We have to get this right. And I think one of the challenges is the complexity here, as, as we know, in a lot of different situations, once you have regulators sort of pouring over after the fact, trying to figure out what's going on. There's a whole business that's running at the same time as well. And so looking at a highly technical, highly regulated business, 
while also fixing some of those issues from the past is a major undertaking. And, and I can't see another way without giving this the proper attention through a, a monitorship, as you've suggested, to get there. You know, on this podcast, we don't make firm predictions, but we do like to try and sort of look ahead. So maybe think two to five years out. What do you think this situation is going to look like? That maybe you do best case, worst case, but where do you think we're headed here? Well, the Department of Justice has suggested a three-year monitorship for Boeing. So I think that will be the framework for the monitor, whatever the form of that monitor is, whether it's the omnibus monitor or the sole monitor that the DOJ wants. So I think we're looking at three years. There's a CCO certification. There will be as much scrutiny on Boeing going forward as there has been in 2024, starting in January, when that first door blew out over Alaska. And so everybody's going to be watching this. And I don't want to say I can't imagine failure, but I can't conceive of anything positive coming out of that for Boeing, for its stakeholders, for people like you and me, for our country, and indeed for the rest of the world. So we have to get it right. We have to improve Boeing. We cannot continue to have this series of incidents after incidents after incidents. And there has to be a change. So this is probably the first time I've ever said there has to be a monitor. It has to work. Totally agree. The stakes couldn't be higher, as we've discussed. And on the positive side, you know, I think we're getting to a point where we're close to having a lot of the skeletons out of the closet here where we can actually start to chart a path ahead. I do think we've turned a corner. I think there's still issues, right? Uh, you know, everyone can point to the space station, of course, even this afternoon. But look, I think we have an ability at this point to bring the right stakeholders to the table and really get this right. And I totally agree, Tom. We have to get this right. Boeing has to be a player going forward, and there's no reason an American company can't lead the way. I hope so, and I hope Boeing feels that way about the monitorship as well, that the monitorship is going to help them get back to being the best airplane, airline, aircraft manufacturer literally in the world. I think that's a good place to pause for today. I appreciate you guys joining us for another episode of Riscology by Infortal.